Brendan. Hello, my name is Jaden, and this is my brother's story. He was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy when he was just one years old. But I don't know what that means. The doctors told my parents that he would have difficulty moving, eating, and breathing. He told my parents he would not live past two years old. But my parents never stopped fighting for him. My parents loved us, cared for us, and watched over us. Brandon made many friends, and I made many happy memories. Every week, one baby is born with SMA in Malaysia. WeCare Journey supports families affected with SMA. Today, there are two drug therapies that can stop this disease. To families affected, these treatments are a second chance. I know it is hard for my family, but knowing that they are not alone means that there is hope. And while there is hope, we will keep supporting one another. I got a second chance to have a happy life. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to all. Uh, welcome to this morning's launch event uh, for the report Living with Spinal Muscular Atrophy in Malaysia organized by Pesatan We Care Journey. My name is Azro Mabkalib from the Galen Center for Health and Social Policy. Uh, please find the agenda for this morning sent to you via the link provided in the chat box below. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a busy month for those in the spinal muscular atrophy community. Uh, August is, as you know, SMA Awareness Month. Uh, for those who have been following We Care Journey series or webinars for the past two weeks, let me say that it has been a tremendous honor to have your interest, support, and commitment, not only from many of the states here in Malaysia, but also from Singapore and as far away as Hong Kong and Bhutan. Thank you for being with us here on this journey. These series of webinars on SMA and today's launch for this important report has been made possible with the support of Biogen, Novartis and Roche. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, around 4,000 Malaysians are estimated to be living with SMA and as many as 700,000 are thought to be carriers of the gene which causes this genetic disorder. A child is estimated to be born every week with spinal muscular atrophy. The dedication commitment of parents, caregivers, and the courage and strength of children and adults with SMA, many of whose stories are represented here this morning, which you will hear and see and captured in this report, continue to inspire and recharge us with hope and optimism for the future. Today, with the possibility of new treatment available for SMA on the horizon, children, teens, and adults with SMA are living healthy, productive, and fulfilling lives. However, the road is long, and while the journey for many families with SMA in Malaysia continues to be supported by the combined voices and efforts of organizations and advocates, such as We Care Journey, there is still much work ahead especially amidst demands of the COVID-19 crisis, which appear to have swamped everything else in its path. It is easy to forget that there are other medical conditions which exist and need to be urgently addressed. SMA is one such condition. There is much to learn from this crisis to address uh, gaps, fulfill needs, and mobilize resources. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, to uh, begin uh, today's uh, session, uh, we would like to have one of those voices uh, to speak to you today. And that is uh, uh, from the co-founder and president of uh, Persatuan We Care Journey, uh, who is uh, comprising 
of not just Edmund Lim, uh, but he, Yap Suk Yi, and their 10 year old son, Brandon, who have been fierce and passionate advocates on the issue of SMA. Uh, their lived experiences, uh, caring and supporting Brandon, are similar to many families who are here this morning. Uh, they, along with many others, provide inspiration and motivation for other families with SMA, helping light the way forward. Let's hear from him. Edmund, the floor is yours. Thanks, Azru. Hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. You know, it's, it's so good to see everyone here today. Um, uh, I will go through and, you know, try to chat with all of you afterwards. But as we all know, these sort of digital platforms, it's hard for me to see who's here today. Uh, but based on people who have registered, you know, I'm so encouraged to see, you know, people from uh, the health authorities, doctors, professionals, our industry partners, and many from the public, especially our donors and supporters, uh, making time this morning uh, to be part of this launch. This uh, idea um, to survey the voices of the SMA community started, I think, you know, back in 2017, or it did start in 2017. Um, now, it seems like it's taken so long right now. It's four years after the fact, but, you know, there were some, you know, starts and stops along the way. But it started, it was catalyzed because of the experience that I had with my wife when my son was first diagnosed 10 years ago, you know, almost to the day. You know, it's almost to today. Um, back in those days, it was really hard to sort of find someone to talk to and find out what to do. And it stays with me. Uh, this incredible loneliness and isolation and uncertainty and fear of what's going to happen. It is over time, though, that's, you know, as we got to know more families, we start, started to connect with more families and started to understand their journeys as well, that we could see that everyone's journey wasn't exactly the same uh, because of the different type of SMA, before, because of, you know, um, our own family backgrounds, where we live, etc. But as we understand each other's journeys, we start to see some of the commonalities in the obstacles that we face and the challenges that we're up against. It is from these commonalities that we start to find some strength to know that people have gotten through um, the difficult times and how they've managed to get through the difficult times and to learn from it. So that being the catalyst, um, it was something that I wanted to really do to let people have their voices heard. Not everyone's comfortable speaking out. Not everyone's able to or has the opportunity to as well, but everyone's got an incredible story to tell and for each of us to learn from. And that's really how this study started. Eventually, we found the right team and we've got Biden as a sponsor to help to provide us a grant to actually get it done. And as I now look at what we've done with this report um, and I reflect back, I, I start to see that it's not just about giving people a chance to have their voices heard, but what value that really has for everyone. And here's what I think, you know, from a community point of view, you know, as, as one of the families in that community, you know, it, it helps me really feel that I'm not alone. It helps me understand the people who are, have come before us, who are also with new kids as well, to understand what's that shared experience that we have. And in that shared experience, of course, nothing's perfect. But to also understand that as we're trying to tackle those challenges that we have, that with other people being part of the journey, understanding that other people are part of that journey, but in a slightly different way, but still facing a similar challenge, that we feel that our voices are amplified, that we're not alone. And I think that's a value to the community that we can start off with as well, uh, start off with. And when we think of, when we bring together these shared experiences of the community, I think also of the healthcare providers, right? And the healthcare providers being the doctors, being the professors, being the hospitals, being the medical uh, device manufacturers, our pharmaceutical manufacturers as well, all, you know, therapists, everybody within the medical and healthcare uh, sector, you can start to also understand what the real impact is of the work that you do, that you bring. Because most times as healthcare providers, you see us in the clinics or in a healthcare setting. You know, that's a very short span of time in our lives. And you don't get to spend more time, or it's hard to spend more time to understand the good that you do within that space, how it translates across other and many other areas of our lives. It's not just healthcare. 
you know, taking care of healthcare has many, many other benefits and many other impacts um, to our lives, not just to the patient, to the caregivers, you know, to our siblings, to our extended family as well. And hopefully, when you understand your, that impact, it's where you can understand the value that you bring in what you do. And when I think about beyond the healthcare providers, and I think about the government and the policymakers and the community at large as well, which is the public, when you see not, when you understand how not just, when you understand that it's not just a health issue, but how a health issue affects families and communities and how those communities are part of the bigger society as well at large, they can then truly understand the value of a report like this and what it means for every one of us. And I think what it means is two things. Right. The one thing is accept that we don't do anything else. And from there, we really understand what that tremendous burden is, burden is, not just on the families affected, but overall also on the society, because that burden spills over in terms of the needs of the community as well. And on the other hand, is what we can do better. And I'm really encouraged because looking at, whilst we're launching this report today, we've also had the opportunity to have engagements, something like this, to bring stakeholders together to understand the impact of living with SMA and to also experience how things have managed to take off since, for example, 2019, the end of 2019, where we brought some of you together to understand the impact of living with SMA and to understand what roles that we could play and to then see as well how much can change and how much, you know, when people put in their part and work together, how much we can really transform the living experience of families with SMA and how we can also benefit the community at large and the society at large as well. I, I don't want to take up more time um, because Dr. Cheng is really going to go into this uh, report. And after that, we've got an incredible panel of people to discuss you know, what this means as well and what possibilities they are. I do want to thank everyone who's involved in pulling this report together. Firstly, the research team who are here today, or most, I hope everyone's here today, but behind the research team are other people as well, playing supportive roles to make sure that this happens. Of course, it's Biogen who write the grant to ensure that we can get things done. I would like, hopefully, to be able to say hi to everyone. So, you know, please use the chat in Zoom to say hi, to say you're here. Um, you know, it's hard to sort of see everybody. But everyone being here today gives me so much encouragement, you know, so much encouragement to know that people do care and people understand that the small roles that we can all play together can really move forward what, to be honest, felt like a very hopeless condition for me and the family 10 years ago to what has become a very hopeful condition and a life of possibility and real opportunities as well. And to think about how we can all work together around improving the equity, the affordability and the sustainability as well of much better healthcare practices and not just healthcare practices as well, right? Getting to school, getting work, you know, building a life, independent living, all these other things that really make, you know, uh, what's, what life is important to all of us. I look forward to meeting all of you, you know, today. I look forward to connecting with all of you after this as well. I'm not going to take any more time because, you know, there's really so much, you know, great talks which are coming up. Uh, thank you again for being here today. Um, I'll pass it back to Azru. Thanks, Azru. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you so much uh, for uh, providing us with many of your words of encouragement and definitely uh, some points that we need to think about. And certainly I think about what you said just now about what we can do better, what actions can we take, uh, what are the low hanging fruit that's in front of us right now that we can actually take advantage of. But most importantly uh, is how can we work together to make that change uh, that we want to see in the SMA community. So uh, we now come to the uh, part that uh, we've all been waiting for, and definitely uh, the report uh, being launched today, uh, Living with Spinal Muscular Atrophy in Malaysia, uh, is a seminal report which contains the findings, the first research in Malaysia into the lived realities of the SMA patients, their families, and caregivers. The findings and 
recommendations from this study should be implemented to improve the quality of life for the SMA community. So ladies and gentlemen, I know you've all been waiting for it. Let's launch the report. Hello, Uh, Okay, cabaran kami menjaga anak SME ini lah cara penjagaan anak SME ini. Alhamdulillah sekarang sikit banyak info dan maklumat tu ada. Okay, selain itu cabaran dari segi keuangan kerana kebanyakan peralatan yang ada perlukan tu kos yang agak tinggi. Okay, harapan kami uh, semoga anak-anak SME kat Malaysia ni diberi peluang uh, rawatan sama macam anak-anak yang di luar negara This report shows us what we can do to improve the health, education, employment and inclusivity for patients and families with SME. We all have a role to play. How can we do better today? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Those inspiring stories of courage of uh, strength and unwavering commitment tell us through example and lived experiences the power of combining the love and dedication of parents, siblings, families, and caregivers with effective treatments and continuous physiotherapy. Uh, those stories launches this report. It's very clear that love finds a way to make the impossible possible. Uh, just a reminder that the uh, report is downloadable, downloadable at smacare.org. Uh, smacare.org is a website which delivers relevant information to enable families with SMA to achieve better health in their lives. Through trusted, comprehensive medical content, uh, insights from experts and real families and useful toolkits, the website aims to help answer what is SMA, the impact on families, how to prevent, diagnose and treat SMA effectively and early, and why it matters to solve unmet needs and provide optimal care and support. Please go on to the website smacare.org after today's session. Um, I would like to uh, uh, thank everyone who has been instrumental in uh, making this report possible and for us to be able to hear uh, in a short while about the findings from this report. Uh, to talk us a bit more about the findings uh, of the document that was launched a moment ago, uh, I would like to uh, uh, 
invite Dr. Cheng Gek Siu. Uh, she is the head at the genetic department in Kuala Lumpur Hospital, which serves as the National Referral Center for Inherited Metabolic Disorders and Genetic Disorders in Malaysia. Uh, she completed a clinical genetics fellowship program and trained at the Institute of Human Genetics uh, International Center for Life in the UK. Uh, Dr. Chen is a committee member of the National Task Force for Pediatric Palliative Care, and she has a keen interest in mindfulness-based therapies and their clinical application in supporting caregivers and patients with life-limiting genetic disorders. Uh, over to you, Dr. Chen. I hand it over. Thank you, Astro. So, um, thank you everyone for coming on board today. We are celebrating August, the SMA Awareness Month, and the launching of the report today. I'm very delighted to share this report that has taken us almost more than two years to complete. And, and I hope you will stay tuned till the end of this um, program. So let's just uh, share my screen. So, um, this report, you can download it to have a better idea of what I'll be presenting because it's just a very short time for me to share the gist of the report. As a start, I'd just like to introduce SMA. It's caused by deletion in the survival motor neuron 1 gene and is inherited as an autosomal recessive manner in which both parents are carriers of the gene mutation. SMA is characterized by loss of the anterior pon motor neurons in the spinal cord, resulting in progressive denervation of the muscle, leading to muscle atrophy and weakness. It is a rare and life-limiting genetic disorder and a leading cause of death in children less than two years. The incidence is estimated worldwide and in our own study of 1 in 10 to 20,000 live births, and Malaysia having uh, 500,000 live births a year is estimated that we have around 25 to 50 babies born annually, and the carrier frequency of 1 in 50. The disease has no cure, but there are existing FDA-approved disease-modifying therapies. So without a cure, the impact of having this disease are manifold, which I will go into now. The goals of the United Nations NGO Committee for Rare Disease are fully aligned with many of the 17 sustainable developmental goals and support the United Nations vision to create a world where every single human can lead a dignified life. In 2019, member countries, including Malaysia, adopted the United Nations Political Declaration on Universal Health Coverage, which includes rare diseases. It commits all governments to strengthen efforts address rare diseases in their plan to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. Universal health coverage ensures all people everywhere can access quality health services with financial protection. Uh, Dr. Chung, if, yes? if perhaps you could put on your microphone, there's some interference that we're hearing, if you don't mind. All right. Thank you.
Uh, apologies for the interruption. Can you hear me better without the interruption now? It is clear. Thank you, Dr. Chung. All right. So I'll continue. So working towards the SDG goals and the universal health coverage, what we have done so far is in 2018, where that's our first small step of trying to understand the epidemiological data of burden of disease of SMA in Malaysia. And subsequently, we went on to do this impact study, which we are launching today, the findings. And hopefully, with this real uh, world evidence, we will create more awareness and to hopefully shape policies and practices. And then there are more work to be done to think about the immediate next steps and what would be our next milestone. From the report review, I would tell you why we first embarked on this study, because there was very lacking in knowledge amongst public and healthcare providers about the health challenges and psychosocial economic issues faced by persons living with SMA and their caregivers. And with the evolving SMA treatment landscape, our community, our SMA community in Malaysia loses out as there was no opportunity for them to access clinical trials and to receive novel therapies. What this study hoped to achieve, we have highlighted challenges and can understand the impact of this debilitating condition on the SMA community. With this, we can identify potential areas of improvement and how we can further manage patient expectations and performance of the healthcare services. Hopefully, with these findings, we can inform service provision and healthcare resources allocation for the management of SMA in Malaysia. And this study also supports the SMA advocacy efforts. How did we do this study? We obtain patient feedback and patient care experience through a mixed method, which consisted of two parts. The first part is the quantitative study, which was based on a questionnaire. And the second part was a qualitative study, which we utilize in-depth interviews and focus group discussion based on interview guide. So the SMA quantitative study was adapted from Cure SMA Voice of the Patient Report in 2018 in America, and which consisted of four domains looking into the demographic patterns, the impact in daily lives, symptoms that matter most in the lives of the pers persons living with SMA and their caregivers, and subsequently management and treatment options. We had a total of 42 respondents to this quantitative study. As you, as you can see here, um, we have 13 persons living with SMA and six of them have SMA type 2 and seven with type 3. The SMA caregivers were mainly, in fact, majority are all parents, except for one which is actually a non-Malaysian paid care assistant to a type 3 SMA patient. What did we find? We found that the mental health burden is exceedingly very high. The top three responses in coping with SMA are stress, anxiety, and depression. Almost three quarters of caregivers experience anxiety, and half of the patients and caregivers feeling stress with coping with SMA. 40% of caregivers gave up their jobs or lost their job 
because they have to take care of a family member. And in a small number actually experience social isolation and troubled relationships. What are the activities that are most limited by SMA, which we all take for granted? Independence in mobility, the inability to move around the house, go to school, or even work independently. Transferring from a wheelchair or a scooter to the bed or the toilet takes immense effort. Engaging in physical activities is something that they are not able to do. Example, playing sports. What more for something such so basic as lifting a fork and spoon to feed oneself or dress oneself? And the fourth uh, top most uh, activities that are limited is attending to personal hygiene independently and going to the restroom or toilet by oneself. The other activities that are mentioned are turning in bait, engaging in social activities and building relationships such as dining out or even dating. So the significant symptoms that affects the daily living and quality of life correlates with what I have mentioned earlier. Muscle weakness and contractures cause um, a lot of struggles with uh, activities of daily living, such as eating, bathing, and dressing oneself. Ineffective cough due to weak respiratory muscles, uh, the patients would face a lot of difficulties with coughing out phlegm, and they practically drowned in their own secretion. I would now share with you the qualitative study of this um, report. The SMA qualitative study was adapted from CNA all in 2015 we should talk about the understanding, the experience and needs of individuals with SMA and their parents. And it also consisted of four domains, which are listed here. And I would go in each of the findings for each domain. Before that, I would like to just share the characteristics of the participants in this qualitative study. So not all of the uh, participants in the quantitative actually went on to enroll in this, and we need to get their consent because this uh, qualitative study uh, was uh, in a more, um, it takes uh, at least one to two hours per session to interview them. So seven uh, persons living with SMA were interviewed either as uh, in the in-depth interviews or in a focus group discussion. Five of them has SMA type two and two with type three. And out of the 23 caregivers who consented to proceed to be interviewed, uh, Four of the families have had a previously affected child and five of them have had lost their child previously. And the mothers and the fathers were interviewed either is as in-depth interviews or focused discussion uh, in both mother's group and father's group and also as a mixed fathers and mothers. The key findings will translate to the recommendations that I will share later. The impact of this chronic debilitating condition to the SMA community are manifold and they encompass the biosocial, biopsychosocial, spiritual domain. And it's also very important that the recommendations um, we'll look into making sure that all these domains are taken care of. Relating to the diagnosis of SMA, many 
actually shared about the long journey for getting the diagnosis. Going through numerous visits to the pediatrician and specialist, and some even uh, getting a misdiagnosis. Also in delayed in referral to the specific specialty. Lacking of awareness and knowledge amongst the healthcare professionals is one main important reason. And also lacking of supportive services in providing the early intervention program. Many um, caregivers express the um, attitude of healthcare professionals in overlooking parental concern with the developmental delay in the child. Many also felt that their doctors communicated the diagnosis in an insensitive and unhelpful manner not providing adequate information. In fact, some of the caregivers had to Google and look up the information themselves. And also not providing support and skills to better care for their child. So they are basically very lost. As for the impact on the life, I would be um, telling you separately as uh, from the perspective of the persons living with SMA and the caregivers. And the impact of life would be related to also their worries and concern. So for persons living with SMA, they have um, lots of self-doubt, lack of motivation and frustration as a consequence of abuse and also always being compared to a normal sibling. They also face challenges due to deteriorating functional abilities. And that would actually cause them to have fear of losing independence, which makes them to be very dependent and reliant on personal care assistance, either paid or their own parents. With this loss of control and helplessness, there's always this anticipatory anxiety and stress. And no wonder, you know, depression, stress, and anxiety are the three uh, top most response. So they also encounter non-inclusiveness in school and workplace and the lack of disabled friendly public facilities. What about the caregivers? The caregivers would struggle with their changing lifestyles or having to give up you know, their hobbies to look after a child with SMA. Family relationships um, may be strained uh, between couples uh, looking after a child or even among their own uh, close family when um, there are uh, invitations to say a kanduri or a wedding function are not being able to meet. Unsupportive schooling environment is another factor where parents have trouble getting their children in school. Myth because of this misconception that you know they need to be in um, a class with learning disabilities which we know that SMA does not affect the cognitive function. Uh, discrimination and bullying also happens. And a very important factor is on financial burden. There are lots of uh, expenses incurred with um, providing care for a patient with SMA such as the modification of the home um, to accommodate wheelchairs, for example, and also um, the equipments, which are very costly, such as the uh, ventilators, uh, BiPAP machine or cough assist machine or suction machine. And of course, the therapies that are very essential to keep them uh, working. So, Caregivers face a lot of uncertainty, as uh, mentioned by Edmund earlier, for the children's future. 
they always would have that in their mind, who will take care of them, you know, when they passed on. And this anticipatory fear of premature death and dying. Some mothers or fathers, they have experienced a previously traumatic uh, passing of an infected child and the need to make very difficult treatment choices and advanced care plans. We have also very um, lack of awareness in school and in the public. For example, the very um, obvious inconsiderations regarding um, lifts and uh, parking space for OKU. And the uh, community acceptance uh, for persons with disabilities because of this social stigma. So uh, what the community wants, uh, hopefully they can have um, a post-diagnosis uh, holistic care, which will encompass you know, a whole of a lifetime uh, service for them, including palliative care and respite care. And of course, uh, they hope to actually have access to treatment and clinical trials for novel therapies. Many um, praise the effort of a WeCare journey and patient support group in helping them able to care for their child better through mutual sharing of information and experiences and providing emotional support to each other. Mental health counseling was one of the um, needs that was uh, brought up. The patients and caregivers, uh, they want to learn coping skills to help cope better and to prevent burnout. Inclusion in education, as well as non-discrimination at work and providing public awareness would hopefully change the perception towards persons with disabilities. There was also a call to the government to improve disability services access, example, in the public amenities and transport facilities for persons with disabilities. And hopefully that would provide, that would provide it a clear and committed policy direction to govern regulations and incentives, and hopefully also genetic non-discrimination. Moving forward, we have four um, very important points for recommendation. That is strengthening the clinical management of SMA, and that would also include most uh, rare disease which is implementation of a systematic and coordinated approach and whole of a lifetime service in uh, incorporate, in incorporating all the different specialties in a multidisciplinary team. So treatments are not cure, but it's very important to implement at least the minimal standards of care. With the high mental health um, burden, emotional support is highly uh, required and needed for every stage of the disease from the initial shock and acceptance of getting a diagnosis of SMA and being told the prognosis, the anxiety and stress from caregivers for having cared the children, especially when they have you know, intercurrent illness for pneumonia. Uh, these are times of crisis and extreme stress. And to prevent risk of burnout, as also the grief and bereavement when a child passes away. The third one is very important in empowering patient parent advocacy organization. In the community, in the education uh, reform and employment um, opportunities, uh, we hope to 
change perception towards um, persons living with disabilities. The needs of patients did take priority of care. Hence, it's very essential for patient and family to articulate their needs with regards to accessibility laws, school or teacher aid, and in even hiring of personal care assistant, and of course, workplace discrimination. There is a need to have a allocated budget or perhaps coming up with innovative and sustainable funding for orphan drugs and outlawing genetic discrimination for insurance companies. Looking ahead from 2018 and now, and hopefully in the next couple of years, there would have a SMA registry, which would hopefully be able to provide us with more accurate prevalence data. And we are hopeful for perhaps the next milestone, there'll be access to treatment for our SMA patients. This is just a schematic thing that I've come up with. Um, the very important to recognize that the patient and the family is center to all this and having a diagnosis and the subsequent management and education is very important. In the larger picture, we need uh, regional and global networking, which SMA WeCare Journey has um, done very well to hopefully um, be able to have more capacity building and also influence policy. So perhaps it's time now um, to have a pause and reflect. You know, the heart is like a garden and it can actually grow compassion or fear, resentment or love. What seeds will you plant there? Only through education, dedication and cooperation amongst all stakeholders are we able to bring about these feelings of altruism and compassion in society at large. We remain hopeful that we can build and celebrate an inclusive culture where diversity is embraced and persons with differential ability are respected and valued. And lastly, we would like to thank all uh, persons living with SMA and the beautiful angels. And of course, the research team here and We Care Journey for providing also um, the support and logistics and Biogen for the grant. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Um, what a beautiful way to end your presentation and to uh, emphasize on the role of compassion and uh, the emphasis on respect and dignity. I, I, I certainly will be remembering that uh, from this uh, uh, presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chung. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure some of you have burning questions uh, regarding the presentation. Uh, please do not hesitate to ask them uh, during our upcoming session, uh, as we have Dr. Fahisham, who was part of the uh, team that put together this study. Uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And please do not use the chat to do that. Uh, put in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, because we have quite a few remarkable panelists with us this morning, as you can see from the slide there, uh, I would like to just uh, uh, complete our introductions uh, of them so that we can go straight into the discussion uh, with our panelists, five panelists today. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Aisha Ruz, or better known as Shah Ruz, is the co-founder of uh, Aubergine, Design Collective and a person living with SMA Type 3. Uh, she started her own design company because the current workplaces in Malaysia weren't a uh, person with disability friendly, which led to her championing inclusive spaces that accommodate all people. 
Uh, her body of work uh, succinctly portrays the potential that SMA uh, patients are able to achieve when given the opportunity to actively participate in society. And I also hear that she does scuba diving. Um, we have uh, our next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Sharatul, sorry, uh, Puan Sharatul Azma, or Katsha, as she's well known. Uh, she is the mother of an adult daughter with one of SMA and another daughter who passed away from the same condition at 15 years old. She is also a self-made entrepreneur who strongly advocates for the SMA community, who has also appeared on uh, BFM radio uh, and local news outlets to bring awareness to professionals and public alike. Next is Dr. Hu Tik Bing, uh, who specializes in general pediatrics and pediatric neurology and is based at the Pediatric Institute in Hospital Kuala Lumpur. He qualified with his MBBS from University of Malaya in 1987 and in 1996 uh, with his uh, Master of Medicine in Pediatrics from University of Malaysia. Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Hu was part of the Committee in Child Neurology and uh, Pediatric uh, development Pediatrics in the 2019-2021 term at the Malaysian Society of Neurosciences. Uh, we have with us uh, all the way from Kota Baru, Kelantan, from the East Coast is Dr. Faisham Taib, who is currently a pediatrician and senior lecturer at the University of Science of uh, Malaysia. He is qualified from University uh, College Dublin in 1999 and completed his PEDS training with the Royal College of PEDS and Child Health uh, UK. Uh, he is currently based in the East Coast. And lastly, we have uh, Dr. Tan Hui Siu, uh, who is a full-time clinician for the past 17 years with administrative and policy-making experience. She graduated from University of Malaya in 2004 and obtained her professional degree in 2010. She holds a Master of Bioethics from Harvard University, and she is currently concentrating her efforts in establishing clinical ethics support in public hospitals. And she is the co-founder of the Malaysian Bioethics Committee. And she recently led the editorial work for bioethics and COVID-19 guidance for clinicians. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome uh, to our session. Let me just put you on and uh, please, uh, switch on your video and we'll have you straight into the session. And just to have all of you here. Uh, I think we're still missing uh, Dr. Hu. Uh, if we can just have Dr. Hu there. Uh, I cannot start my video because the host has stopped it. Uh, let me just exit. Hold on, yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Hu. So we have uh, Katsha with us. Uh, just waiting on uh, Sharuz. Uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, hold on. Let me just put you on. Okay, so welcome. It's a full uh, panel that we have here this uh, morning. So I just want to make sure that we have everybody here before we start and then we'll, we'll flip to you uh, when your time comes for the different uh, questions. But please leave your video on and we'll get to you. So let's go to it then. You know, um, uh, you know there's been a lot of discussions. Uh, there's a lot of information that has been shared here with us. Uh, uh, this morning, we just heard the presentation by the different uh, speakers. Uh, and I would like to just ask the first question to uh, 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 Aisha. Can I call you Sharuz? Uh, yeah, for okay. sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to most things. Okay. KU works too. Okay. Well, let me ask you then, uh, Sharuz. You know, uh, I heard just now in, in uh, Dr. Chung's presentation just now, uh, something that rings quite true, and that is that we take for granted uh, many of the uh, things that, you know, if, if you didn't have SMA, you know, like uh, walking, being able to do things, uh, and especially when you're coming into adulthood, right? So 
uh, many who are viewing this, this discussion today are with SME and perhaps are also anxious about getting prepared for adult world. And, uh, you know, what are your insights or experience can you share with us, uh, uh, especially for those who don't have SMA, to be able to appreciate some of those uh, obstacles, challenges that need to be overcome? And how do we uh, come about to help them and their caregivers in preparing to make that transition into adult? Go ahead, uh, Shelly. I feel like when it comes to answering this question, there's always three things that you should focus on. Um, the parents, the environment, and the person. Uh, the first thing I'd like to bring about is the topic of parents. I, I feel like a lot of SMA parents and disabled parents, um, parents of disabled people, tend to coddle us too much. Um, there, there is an interesting thing that happens when you coddle a child too much. We stop thinking that we can do a lot of things. It's, um, I think... I think psychologically it's called learned helplessness. Um, I'm not saying don't help your kids. I'm also saying, you know, let them make mistakes. Uh, when it comes to personal stuff, when it comes to the person, it's, it's more a sense of after making those mistakes, you kind of learn, okay, um, maybe I shouldn't do certain things. Maybe I can do certain things because I, grew up with a lot of people telling me what I can and cannot do. Um, I, I guess in a way, uh, my personality is the kind that if you tell me I can't do something, I'll go do it. <laughs> and there have been many instances where um, to my mother's chagrin, um, I have gone off and done the thing that she told me not to do. Uh, one of the examples is to go diving. Um, I remember she told me, don't go diving, you will die. And then I thought, no, I won't. So I got a job and um, I paid for it. But the, the thing is, after I have paid for all of it, it, it sort of defeated the purpose of her going, you can't go. So she let me go anyway. Um, what else? When it comes to the community, it's also this sense of belonging and a uh, sense of not isolating yourself just because you're different from everyone else. Uh, it's, it's knowing when to put yourself forward and when to, you know, hold back a bit. Uh, and it's something that doesn't happen if you don't have that kid or that person exist outside their sphere of parental or familial influence. Yes, siblings and parents are nice, but you learn more from your friends. You learn more from the community you interact with. You learn more from school. You learn more from college um, and other activities. Uh, is there anything that you want me to add? University stuff? Oh, life stuff. Um, when it comes to life stuff, I, I feel like growing up with SMA, you come across certain barriers that are implemented on you by society. Um, but at the same time, you're ensconced in this bubble of love and care and, and all the, the fluff, like, like you're being covered by a duvet all the time. So when you're a child, that's okay. But when you're an adult, when you turn 18, society expects you to become independent. Society expects you to graduate get a job, get a spouse. But when you're disabled, that's a very difficult thing to do. I think when I graduated, I was so excited to come out into the working world. But what I've discovered was, and this still hurts me a lot, is, is that although I was accepted to many of the companies, I had to reject them because there is a point in your life when you go I'm going to be working for this company, most likely eight to 12 hours. We're talking the architectural industry here. They are not kind. And I'm not going to hold my bladder for that long. So these, these are one of the situations okay. where you got to think of, is it worth it? Like these medical bills, the company is not going to support if they can't even put 
disabled access and toilets, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I guess that's where I'm coming from. Thank you, um, Sharuz, because those are some of the issues that we take for granted. And it's important for us to realize that these are lived realities and they need to be able to hear this. I, I really wanted us to start this conversation with, with your words and your voice. And I'm going next to uh, Katsha. Uh, you know, we're, we're told, Katsha, that um, the uh, landscape for uh, SMA today has changed for the better. And you heard the video just now again. Uh, Kaladulu, there was not enough information now that's better, that now there's more interest in SMA. Are there more engagement and, and willingness to help and support from both the public and private health sectors? So do you agree with that, uh, um, Kasha, in, in, in that assessment? And what are the gaps or concerns that you feel need to be addressed and needs to be taken action on? Go ahead, Kasha. Thank you, Azrul. Uh, Salam alaikum and good morning, everyone. Uh, I think um, uh, speaking through my experience, I would say yes, mm -hmm. Compared to my time, uh, you know, I, it took us for more than two years to, to find out what is wrong with Aina. Okay, um, Aina was diagnosed when she, she was two and a half years old through biopsy. And um, uh, when the doctors break the news to us, um, I have no idea what is SME. I don't understand what is SME. And um, uh, we were informed that uh, there is no cure and no treatment. And that time, there's no Mr. Google. So the only information that I can get is only through the, uh, through the doctors and through the hospitals. And, and if we go for the hospital visit, we, uh, you know, the waiting hours is longer than the, the consultation you know, with the doctors. And um, what uh, we could do is uh, when Aina and uh, Adi were little, um, all we could do is just simply love our girls and uh, keep them comfortable. Even though we know that, you know, uh, the war is going on inside their body. But we just remain hopeful and um, pray for a better tomorrow. But now today, I, um, I think looking at the uh, number of um, SME patients, especially the early diagnosed, uh, keep increasing. Um, more families uh, can be reached out. And let me share you one story. Uh, you know, uh, Aina's um, ex, um, Aina ex um, schoolmate, Daniel, uh, he has a child. And the child is uh, diagnosed with SME type 1. You know, when, um, when we heard the news, he called me. He called me and shared the sad news. And I refer this to Wicca Journey. We shared this information, you know. Uh, and then uh, the child was referred to HKL and finally the child got tricked that. So what I'm trying to say here is that the, the process is very fast compared to our time. You know, last time I now get a diagnosis from the biopsy, now they can do the blood test. And if you can detect earlier, that means you can go for early intervention programs, which is very important for SME patients. But but still back to your question, I think that, um, you know, there is still things to be improved. I think more awareness and uh, especially for, you know, the hospital, the medical doctors. And uh, maybe doctors can show uh, more compassion, you know, to the fam patients and families. And we really appreciate it very much. Thank you, Kasha. And certainly, uh, you know, your, 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 your statement is it radiates hope, you know, and also uh, the kind of, of progress that you've seen. And it has changed quite a lot can, uh, compared yeah. to before. True. And this is a, a reality today, Kaladulu, it's very hard to get the kind of information. Much of you just check out just now, like, Kaladulu, you don't have Dr. Google or yeah. uh, Ms. Uh, Google <laughs> or Mr. Google. Can. So now you have a lot of information that's available, but also uh, through the different organizations and community support groups. And so today it's a very different uh, scenario and hopefully for the better. Uh, I want to go to uh, uh, Dr. Hu. Uh, and this is where, uh, you know, a lot of, of discussion has come about concerning uh, the need for treatment and care. And we've heard quite a bit today about the role of 
parents, family, siblings even, in making sure that uh, people who live with SMA get the kind of care and support that they need. And it does make a difference. It does uh, uh, help save lives. And it, it, you can see from the videos that we've seen this morning that people actually go forward. So, you know, uh, Dr. Hu, uh, the, the thing is, is that uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the level of care that's available for children with SMA in this country. And I would like to ask is, how do you think uh, it is right now? And how can we do better moving forward? Uh, we've heard some of it just now from Dr. Chung's presentation, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. Go ahead, Dr. Hu. Uh, thank you, Asro, um, and uh, Dr. Chung and the team for um, to uh, having conducted the study and presented the report. Um, um, I personally very touched. Um, so, uh, uh, going back to your questions, um, um, so so in in the past uh, eighteen years, uh, working as a pediatric neurologist. Um, I must say that medical care for uh, uh, SMA have changed quite a bit, in particularly uh, in the last few years. Uh, in the past, uh, we were more in a reactive and a conservative mode. Uh, for example, in the past, children with SMA type 1, um, uh, once the diagnosis is made, um, uh, because there's... Um, uh, no treatment at that time, and uh, they were often uh, being sent home uh, because uh, we know that they passed away uh, soon, very soon after that. For type 2 SMA, uh, we were focusing a, a lot of our effort in uh, get, uh, preventing them from uh, getting chest infection uh, with aggressive uh, treatment so that they won't uh, get uh, uh, the to have the need to be ventilated in ICU. And for a patient with SMA type 3, um, uh, we do have a few, uh, but over the years, we noticed that they, dis they disappear from a clinic, uh, partly because at that time, uh, there's, uh, again, uh, not much uh, um, active treatment that we're offering them. So, um, However, things uh, um, have changed uh, for the better in the past uh, five to ten, I say probably five to 10 years, because we start to recognize uh, even um, um, uh, we may not be able to uh, give them specific treatment, but there are still a lot of things we can offer to them, in particularly in the area of palliative care support to the child as well as to the family. And uh, there has also some improvement in uh, respiratory care uh, by taking a more proactive and um, uh, in clearing the secretion with a cough assist machine, uh, with offering them uh, non-invasive uh, ventilatory support. And uh, we have also started to, to provide them uh, uh, vaccination against uh, pneumococcal as well as influenza routinely. So, and as for uh, other complications like sco uh, scoliosis, uh, we are being more active in terms of uh, scoliosis uh, screening. And over the years, I've seen uh, more and more uh, children with SMA uh, have undergone uh, uh, scoliosis surgery. More excitingly, um, um, uh, when we started to have access to uh, a uh, few of the disease modifying drugs for the past few uh, past uh, uh, since uh, middle of last year for a few of our infants with SMA type one, and um, so uh, when we start to provide this uh, disease modifying drug, uh, it's mandatory that we make sure uh, we optimize the standard of care. Uh, they need uh, regular uh, monitoring uh, by assessing their motor milestone uh, with a standardized to uh, uh, tools. Uh, they need to uh, optimize uh, their nutrition and growth. And, and some we actually uh, um, went on to um, pro uh, provide this by uh, putting a percutaneous uh, gastrostomy. 
Um, however, I think we still have a long way to go uh, because at the moment, none of these disease modifying drugs uh, is registered in Malaysia. Uh, and few of the children who have received uh, this life-changing uh, treatment, they were either under compassionate use program or uh, uh, having participated in uh, clinical trials. Um, so that's my brief comment on your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ku. And, and certainly this is something that uh, we want to be able to discuss further. And it's not just about uh, disease modifying treatments, but also the other aspects of um, uh, therapies for SMA. Well, yeah, we've seen the impact of physiotherapy when it's done effectively uh, with uh, kids uh, with SMA. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hu. We go now to uh, Dr. Fahisham over there in the East Coast. Uh, how's it going, Doctor? Uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, what are your, I think, three key learnings or insights that you've had from being part of the research team uh, of the study launched today? Um, you know, uh, what would you say to the healthcare professionals and policymakers when it comes to uh, making uh, some of those recommendations that we heard this morning a reality? Go ahead, doctor. Okay. Um, um, I think um, there are three, I mean, like, if you ask me about three, I mean, like, there are many findings from the study that we've done uh, recently uh, as presented by Dr. Chung. Um, however, I'm just going to... Um, emphasize on maybe three things which is uh, which are important here number one i mean like we knew i mean like from the um qualitative study that was done that that, that, that there were many um parents who are um suffering from stress i mean like it's about 50 50 plus percent between the uh, patient the, the the patient and also the parents uh, and also in terms of anxiety, I mean, like the, um, there were there were you know staggering number of seventy six percent of the uh, parents um, you know having anxiety related to the experience that they have, uh, and also we also identify a, um, a significant about thirty eight percent. I mean that's I mean like um, as described by Dr. Cheng earlier on. I mean related to a lot of um, uh, things, maybe related to daily. Uh, living things, for example, like mobility, transferring, personal hygiene, etc. Uh, but um, there are also a um, small amount of the numbers uh, who are also suffering from loneliness as well. So I think, I mean, in, in directly, we should be aware that, I mean, like a lot of um, patients and also parents who are looking after children with disability, especially SMA, um, have got, um, you know, um, they, they need support. They need support in terms of, um, uh, the, uh, from these findings, they need support in terms of, you know, managing the stress uh, for whatever reason. I mean, like, because uh, individually, I mean, all uh, parents and patients, they are all different. Uh, but uh, as we are aware as well, they have, um, you know, anxiety, they have stress, and also they have a significant number of depression, especially among the um, patients. The second part of it is that we also knew that um, in terms of experience, um, uh, like Dr. Chen mentioned, that um, um, the healthcare provider, unfortunately, not doing that good because um, uh, in terms of diagnosis, they, 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 unfortunately, the, the family have to um, undergo a long road in order to find uh, the diagnosis. I mean, perhaps nowadays uh, it has changed uh, but again, I mean, like, uh, it is important, I mean, like, to acknowledge that, uh, unfortunately, we need a lot more work to do in order to make uh, awareness um, among the healthcare professionals and also um, uh, with the public as well. Because, I mean, like, there's a lot of stigma related to um, this condition. Uh, the third part of it, I think uh, the most important is about the challenges, you know, because, I mean, um, the, I mean, once you know the diagnosis, um, the problem is that, I mean, afterwards, what's going to happen? What's, uh, what's, what, they, what the parents need to do next with their children? So in terms of, um, uh, you know, getting the diagnosis early, in terms of navigating through the services, because it is a very, very 
complex uh, healthcare um, service around us. You know, how do they get going to get help at home? How do they going to get community support? Uh, and also, you know, um, when do they need to come to the hospital? So these are all very new to the parents who've never had any patient or any any children with SMA. And I reckon, I mean, like um, this uh, need to be addressed again because uh, by understanding the challenges, understanding these experiences as well, uh, that make us, uh, you know, uh, need to uh, be able to tackle uh, the problem related not only to, for the patient and also for the families as well. And thank you, Dr. Faisal. And I think that is a very important series of points that you highlighted, there, especially on the burden on families. You know, I mean, very often it's like a whole mountain came down on them. You know, from not being uh, necessarily health literate, you're suddenly expected to have the kind of knowledge that's able to provide adequate uh, medical support or help, you know, for, for your kid who now has SMA being diagnosed, but then you're expected to know almost everything. You know, you're going to the internet, doing research, and this is where support plays a big role in providing that. And, and we really need to be able to ensure that they get the kind of support that's needed. And this is a very good segue, I think, into the, the next uh, uh, point that I want to raise with Dr. Tan, actually. Uh, and that is because this is, I think, one of the areas that, that you would want to, to be looking at, and especially you do deal with bioethics, especially is, you know, sometimes uh, people with SMA and their caregivers are sometimes forced to depend on others to highlight their issues and, and raise concerns, right? And we heard in the report just now, uh, the, one of the findings was that sometimes healthcare professionals, doctors are themselves not very helpful uh, and may treat uh, patients as sort of passive beneficiaries of medical treatment. So I would like to ask you, um, because you have so much experience in this, is how do we help create uh, the kind of safe spaces for meaningful participation and consultation of views from parents, caregivers, and even you know, siblings who are wanting to help uh, a family member, member with SMA? Because we've heard and we've seen from the videos is that it does help improve uh, treatment, response to treatment. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Tan. Okay, thanks, Azru. Um, I'm actually very honored to be here uh, among all the champions, you know. So I, I would just like to give a bit more context from where I'm going to be speaking from. Um, so I, I have been a general pediatrician for many years. So I think there are a few of us which are very generalists in, um, in at heart. And we have had um, quite a bit of experiences uh, working um, with families because um, I think at, at a point when I was in the district for seven, eight years, um, I think I remembered every SMA child that came to me, their families. And I think the, the, the thing that I've learned as, uh, you know, even, um, you know, from the inner strengths, you know, that these children have, you know, they're so bright and and you know they, they teach me so many things you know even from the parents and how how they actually kind of view life um in a very positive way even though they are from um, suburban poor or rural poor and and i think that is when i think we could see as healthcare professionals the constraint that we have in um trying to help um these children and families and i think when when you when you are talking about healthcare professionals you know in terms of how they are able to help or, you know, to create safe space or, you know, the, the, the attitude that they should have, you know, when receiving um, children with disability and their families. Um, I think we need to look into the different groups and the, the backgrounds, you know, as how, who they represent, you know, are they part of the society? Um, so meaning whether the mindset they have is part of who they are rather than being a professional. So I think, um, to actually embrace diversity in the community is actually very still much lacking among all Malaysians. I think, I think the one thing we would like to see is to say that, you know, um, disabled population and community has so much to offer um, in terms of, um, you know, making, you know, looking at the other aspect of um, life itself, you know, that, that itself, it will kind of make us more human. And I think they, they contribute a lot in terms of uh, better ideas as well, you know. So I think 
I think, to solve problems as a society. So I think that that part as a part of the members of society, I think we are still not there yet. We, we, we kind of um, still exclude them as another group rather than keeping them in the same um, space, you know. Um, you know, so that includes, I think, in the education as well. And so I think we have, um, I remember how we actually try and fought with the schools and, you know, to get uh, to SMA child into uh, the Padana stream and normal stream. And, you know, and we know the impact of them being with other children, the impact of um, them, their presence onto the normal children, you know, the ones without um, disability would be um, so significant, you know, because that is where, um, you know, I think um, as a committee, we, we would probably know that it is best to be diverse rather than, you know, to segregate, you know, um, according to status, you know, class or uh, ability or disability. So I think, I think that is one point I think professionals um, um, is lacking, not, not because it's, it's part of like, you know, how they were trained, but again, how they have been brought up and educated and, the, you know, the whole society and environment they have kind of grown up with. The other end is where healthcare professionals with, um, I think, the training itself and, you know, there's the still the lack of knowledge of how to manage um, um, and diagnose SMA children, like what, um, you know, uh, our dear colleagues have, have actually highlighted. I think the numbers is considered still small. And, and I think that the one thing about having more pediatricians in the country, you know, that, or, or you know, the government or the ministry looking at putting more budget into um, training more professionals and, you know, training, having, um, putting a, a larger pie in terms of uh, child care, health care uh, in pediatrics is actually kind of still, you know, so, so much space to, uh, you know, rooms to improve on that. So I think that is part, uh, that is the part that I think we should uh, look at struggling. Um, um, I, I think struggling to actually kind of offer, you know, options to parents after the diagnosis, you know, where should you get an early intervention program if you are sitting in a place like Telo in Tan uh, mm. versus if you are sitting in Penang or in Kuala Lumpur. And I think that is the one thing that, you know, the tools that we don't actually have to offer to parents. So I think, I think um, it is a sad thing where parents need to kind of navigate through the systems and, and trying to find their own teachers. And, you know, I think, I think that is the one big question I'm going to put forth. The next one is, uh, whose responsibility is um, uh, towards um, children, bright children like the SMAs and, and, you know, would it be the parents' sole responsibility or, you know, um, the state, the government or, you know, the civil society as a whole now, like what we are sitting now. I think, I think that is part of that conversation we are okay. trying um, to aim for, um, you know, the, the attention that we, what, what we owe to, to these children. So. Okay, Dr. Tan, I think that's a great way to actually, uh, Kupas, that particular yeah, uh, problem. So I have answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing is, patient navigation is, is something that somehow we're expected to know. How to go from point A to point B to point C, point B. And the burden goes back onto the caregivers, uh, parents, families, and so forth. And I don't think we have enough appreciation of the struggle that many of them go through. And, and doctors especially are not very well responding to that. Uh, I want to uh, ask some of the questions that have been coming fast and furious uh, on the Q&A and uh, also the chat. So let me go straight to it. Uh, Dr. Faisham, um, this question has been on since uh, 11.30 earlier. And the question here is, is why do you think only 50% of the persons with SMA and their caregivers report uh, feeling stress and it's not a higher number, uh, expecting maybe 90 to 100 percent, given this really challenging disease. Uh, what do you think are the coping strategies for the other 50 percent who don't report that they're uh, feeling stress? And and or is it a bigger issue of you know Malaysians basically conditioned la? You know we don't complain la, we don't complain. You know so uh, we don't, and that's what the report is showing. So uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Faisha. Okay, I might um, add a little bit, a little bit, but uh, maybe Dr. Chen can answer more on this matter. Okay. Um, I reckon, I mean, like, because of me, I think we have a diversity in terms of um, cultural background of uh, our um, participants in the study. 
So which means that uh, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, um, uh, concluding that uh, some of us uh, may report it as stress or some of us may not report it as stress. But then like, uh, I think um, um, depending on the A, I think individual family members, you know, how, how they are facing um, the, um, you know, situation. Uh, maybe at the early phase of the uh, condition versus at the middle of the condition versus at the, you know, depending on the trajectory of the condition itself. So, so basically, I would uh, assume, I mean, like different phase of the disease, uh, they might uh, respond differently. And also uh, depending on the crisis that they are facing. Because I mean, like, if uh, there's no crisis, then I would, I, would, I would assume, you know, at that point of time, they might not reporting anything. But if the, 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 the children are suffering from many medical problems, and therefore, um, those are the things that might, they might be reporting, okay? Um, the um, other thing, perhaps uh, related to, um, I would say, I mean, like, um, you know, maybe racial as well, you know, because I mean, like some of the, because of the participants, they, they might come from the rural background and then some of the, some of the you know, uh, families, um, they are more acceptance rather than, you know, um, uh, having uh, different emotional response to it. So I think that also would uh, differ in terms of uh, the response as well. Uh, but other than that, I wouldn't be able to answer. Maybe Dr. Cheung can okay. you know, uh, add some information for that. Uh, Dr. Cheung, are you there? Can switch on your video and, and join us for uh, answering this question? But I can relate to what you said, Dr. Faisham, that perhaps you know, some people consider it uh, almost like uh, you know, uh, takdir and um, Surah pada Allah and all that, right? So there's a lot of that and, and the unwillingness to, uh, to express that could be seen, you know, if misread as being compl too complaining, you know, and we don't do that uh, very well, I think. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Dr. Chung, uh, are you there? It, yes, uh, um, doctor? Yeah. Uh, would you care to answer, perhaps? Yeah. Right. So I, I do agree with Fahisham's point um, because of our social cultural background and a lot of them you know, have quite great faith in their own faith. And also because we, we also actually did um, a DAF 21 call which didn't actually bring up all this you know, mental health uh, uh, well-being because we only caught all these things in our qualitative study which was you know, uh, more revealing than just the, the, the quantitative, which is probably like Hashi Pashishan was trying to make a point that is at a point of time. And perhaps some of them who have actually over the years, you know, have um, able to cope and um, it has not been um, so stressful for them. As okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chung. Um, next question, uh, would like to ask, uh, um, Sharuz, uh, and that is, um, you know, we've had uh, a, a question responding to some of the issues that you raised in your presentation just now, and, and uh, that is, you know, how, how does a parent know uh, when it's the right time to let their child move forward independently or, or protect their child? I mean, what, when do you know as a parent? What can you advise? Well, Go when ahead, it Sharuz. comes to knowing when to let go. Uh, my first question is, are they rebelling yet? But more importantly, um, it, it really depends. What are you protecting your child from? Who or what is the aggressor? What is the relationship you have with your kid? Um, these are all very important questions to ask yourself. How well do you know your child? Or have, been, uh, have you been living in this made up fantasy world that your kid is perfect and and an embodiment of yourself and an extension of yourself. Children are not an extension of your hopes and dreams. They have their own lived experiences. You have to understand that. Um, I think if, if they're under 10, actually, you know, if we're talking about legally the dolly income tax thing, like if they're under 16, they legally cannot make decisions for themselves, right? Makes sense. But we all know that in school, um, growing up, by the age of 12, 
there there's some weird stuff that happens to a person's body and mind that we start to like things that are very contrary to our parents. It, it depends on um, social aspects. It depends on what we are uh, sort of, uh, what, what we see, especially on media. So really, how well do you know your kid? But Sharuz, uh, let me ask you, uh, I'm sure you've heard more times people saying you cannot. And you seem to be the sort of person who will say, no, I'll do it. You know, you see, the more you tell me I cannot do it, I will be going ahead and trying to do it. How, how do you balance that? I mean, people want to be able to protect and to be able to know that you are able to take on these challenges yourself. But at the same time, you know, there is this, you know, overprotection. You know, like you, you're starting your own business now, right? Um, is it going to be something that you are allowed to fail and people are going to say, Oh, there you see, you can't do it, but you're ahead, going ahead and doing it anyway. I mean, how do you respond to people who say no to you more than yes? Um, for some reason, we come from a society that is deeply ingraining into our children and into our people in general that it's not okay to fail. It is okay to fail. That's how you learn. How do you know fire is hot? Well, somebody's touched it before. <laughs> And if you want to touch it, go ahead. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the idea that you're not allowed to fail. This okay. idea that you start a business and suddenly everything is peachy and keen and clean and perfect. No, most people start a business and they fail over and over again until they realize that, you know, there's certain things that they do that cause them to fail. So they stop doing it. Um, children are not great with negative reinforcement, which is why we give them treats, which is why we give them candy, etc. and so forth. But adults, we're very good at learning from negative reinforcement. And that's what we do. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. But I'm also going to add that I am a person of privilege. I am born in a position of privilege. I have resources that are given to me by my parents by my heritage, um, by the virtue of me being able to speak English. Uh -uh. These are all privileges that I recognize. They are all privileges that I know some people don't have. So when I say start a business, go ahead, those come with extreme caveats. And okay. they are not something that I or anybody can teach other people. Uh, thank you, Sharuz. And I think one of the more important points that you're trying to raise here is, is really that there's no one size fits all template. Everybody's going to have to go through it. Everybody's going to have to learn. And most importantly, everybody has to hear and allow each other to succeed and fail. Uh, uh, Kasha, you know, we've heard a lot today. And one of the things that we heard are also uh, frustrations from caregivers, um, patients, uh, tension, and even helplessness. And definitely some of the uh, issues that we've heard uh, this morning uh, talk about, uh, you know, the safe spaces that are necessary for persons like yourself to seek support. Um, how do you how do you cope? How do you ensure that this environment is able to be created? And most importantly, uh, can you use things like music or songs, uh, you know, in, in the environment? And I'm asking a question that's on the on, on the chat right now. You know, I mean, what kind of mechanisms can you use? And in this case, they're asking whether music helps. Go ahead, Kasha. Um, I think what, what we practiced uh, with uh, myself and my uh, with Aina, you know, three of us in their family, um, we stay happy. That is the key of uh, everything, I think. Because once you are, you know, you feel, because, you know, we know that the journey is um, it's not easy. It's very tough. Okay, but if we keep, uh, you know, keep um, feeling uh, stressed, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, invite all the negative vibes. You no, know, you you can't do anything. You know, you can be sad. You know, because sadness is part of uh, life. But you have to move on. You know, find something that you know you you make yourself happy. Do something that you know. Let's say for your for your child, like Charu said, you know your child is very well. So you do something that you know uh, a bonding time. You you know. Feel that time with the happiness, you know, 
uh, try something new, uh, make it uh, attractive, you know, like uh, enjoy your life, appreciate whatever you have. I think that that, that is the, the one that we are practicing now. Lah. And let's say if you uh, feel like uh, you are feeling <sighs> down, um, you know, uh, if you feel like um, uh, you would like to share something, share with someone, please go ahead, you know. Get some uh, assistant, find someone that you can trust, you talk uh, to them and then uh, just share your feeling, you know. Because the problem is that uh, we are Malaysian, like, I think for, maybe for Malays, you know, we are, we are used to be very reserved, segan, you know. Uh, but, you know, you have to, um, you have to stand up and then um, Support we each do other. this for our, yes, we do this for our, actually for our, for our child, for our family and of course for ourselves. Okay. Thank you, Kasha. I mean, that definitely is very supportive and, and it's, it's a positive way of looking at this and, and being able to cope in a practical manner. Uh, and I think this is something that a lot of us can, can um, take. Uh, Dr. Hu, um, we have a few questions for you. So I'm going to combine uh, a few of the questions. Um, we have a, one here. Uh, as a parent who is often having to see so many doctors. Uh, there are doctors who are active and wanting to do more. And then there are a lot of, of doctors who are pushing me away. Uh, how can I make this better? I mean, what, what can I do differently that can make them basically uh, uh, be more responsive? That's one question. Uh, the second question uh, is, is the Institute of Pediatrics, uh, do they have a plan to help to increase the awareness on rare diseases uh, to help uh, reduce the uh, possible wrong or misdiagnosis or late diagnosis of not only SMA, but all other uh, rare diseases by pediatricians. So there's two questions for you, uh, the first one and the second one. Go ahead, Dr. Hu. Um, first question, um, I think we need to be aware that uh, uh, no two individuals are the same. Uh, so that goes for doctors and other professionals as well. So, um, and uh, some of them may have to do with their knowledge, their training, and their comfort in dealing with uh, certain diseases. Um, so, if a parents uh, find that um, the doctors that they are meeting is not very helpful, they, they have the option to, to seek a second opinion or to find out from um, friends or Pusatuan. Uh, what what uh, what are the doctors they can see? Yeah. So um, so move on. I think um, uh, if you find that um, um, the doctor that um, has been treating your child has not been very helpful, uh, you you have the option to to seek uh, other um, uh, expert. Um, uh, second question is with regards to um, uh, improving awareness among healthcare professionals um, on rare diseases. Um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's ongoing. Um, um, there are so many rare diseases um, and um, uh, in, a, in a lifetime of a healthcare professional, we are not uh, expected to know all. Um, but uh, um, um, the important one, I think uh, most, most of the trained doctor, they should uh, be able to recognize. Um, for example, uh, a spinal muscular atrophy uh, 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 is actually not a, the commonest uh, muscle disease, neuromuscular disorder, yeah? So, um, um, and um, uh, maybe in the past because um, there has not been uh, much of advancement in terms of treatment. So uh, maybe uh, there wasn't much emphasis on uh, the need to recognize them early, uh, get them uh, to places where they can be counseled, treated uh, early. So, um, but I think, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, things, things perhaps will have changed um, uh, certainly in my hospital uh, and uh, Klang Valley, uh, we get a referral quite early, quite, quite fast. Uh, and we, we, we do make a point to see them early uh, because uh, we know the challenges uh, parents are facing. 
Uh, hopefully, this uh, will also change. Uh, this change will be uh, across the board, uh, even in um, uh, other states and um, and um, uh, in in uh, even in district hospitals. Yeah. So um, uh, okay, I think cool. that's all. Yeah. Can I ask you then? Uh, you mentioned about how uh, pediatricians. Uh, uh, having a role in uh, making sure that the uh, referrals, but also the diagnosis is done in a timely manner. Uh, can I ask you, are there any uh, local guidelines uh, being written or have been written on SME standards of care for uh, the Malaysian uh, healthcare scene? Uh, we have not actually um, come up with a so-called Malaysian standard of care, uh, but there is a, what they call um, um, an effort by the Ministry of Health to uh, uh, set up a so-called uh, a committee to look into um, the standard of care and um, uh, support um, for uh, rare disease condition uh, that includes SMA. Okay. But uh, as, as you know, this, this uh, effort has been only started past two years and with the COVID, everything got... <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, disrupted. But help. yeah, disrupted. Yeah, disrupted. So, yeah. so, okay. uh, yeah. So we hope uh, things will have changed, um, maybe in a few years to come. Yeah. Okay. Thank Dr. Thank Dr. Chung raised her hand. <laughs> yeah, I see Dr. Chung there. Please go ahead, Dr. Chung. Yeah. Hi. I I just like to jump in here. I mean, thank you for the participant who asked regarding rare disease and the awareness of it. Um, yeah, SMA is a rare disease, and it's across all rare diseases that we know um, they face common challenges like delay in diagnosis. So, um, you know, most rare diseases are genetic in origin, 80% of them, and it's uh, very important for everybody to know that there are centers in Malaysia with expertise who can make diagnosis. So you need to get to the right people. Yeah, so, so there's the Ministry of Health Hospitals in Kuala Lumpur and Penang, and there's University Hospitals in UMMC, UKM uh, as well. So that's very important. And um, like Dr. Ku mentioned about the National Rare Disease Policy, which is still in its baby steps, um, there's a lot more work to do. You know, um, we've, uh, we need a lot of uh, stakeholders for operation and input and to follow through. And hopefully, you know, that will um, be more meaningful for everybody in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Uh, I would like to go uh, next to uh, Dr. Faisham here. And this is a question, seeing how uh, you are based in Kota Baru, Kelantan. Uh, what improvements or changes would you like to see in integration and linking care and support between patients and hospitals uh, receiving or de delivering SME care? Thank you, Azrul. Um, I think we have to look at, back at the report um, and uh, some of the uh, hopes that were um, echoed uh, in the report uh, uh, were A, I mean, they want to have um, the parents and also um, want to have um, access to treatment. Uh, and as, as, as uh, Dr. Ku rightly mentioned, I mean, like, um, access to modifying drugs. Uh, they are all on, unfortunately, at, at this stage, is, is um, on compassionate programs, uh, which, you know, we have to kind of like liaise with the, uh, um, you know, a certain um, drug company and then try to get some, you know, the um, uh, drugs to come over to Malaysia. Uh, and the other things is about, uh, is about um, gov government kind of like change in terms of um, service and community support because whatever i mean i know what the government now is focusing on COVID and is focusing on prevention rather than you know community uh, community or chronic uh, care for the time being uh, but still uh, there are uh, you know a significant number of uh, children with sma and also a significant number with uh, children with other disability and that's um, where this need to be improved and also related to the policy maker so looking back at all these three hopes 
Um, well, well, I can say, you know, I mean, I'm, because I'm a pediatrician in the rural part, I'm not saying that, I mean, in urban side, there, definitely there's a disparity <laughs> between um, whatever it is in the East Coast versus whatever it is in the West Coast. I mean, even, in fact, Dr. Tan mentioned earlier on, even Lo Intan and KL, I mean, perhaps uh, even different as well. So, so disparity, I mean, like we, we acknowledge that, we know. Um, um, but um, there's a lot of work need to be done in terms of a. I think um, increasing awareness, increasing awareness among the healthcare professionals. Once they are aware of this, then there there, there will be more um, interest in terms of uh, maybe uh, related to um, specialties and also interest in terms of um, transition care. Because I mean, like a lot of our uh, SMA now. SMA type 2 and type 3, they are all surviving, you know, beyond. So therefore, in terms of transitioning from um, pediatric, um, you know, a service to uh, adult service needs to be uh, making smooth. And unfortunately, in adult service, they don't see that much. So uh, there, there, there need to be an interest in that side, on that side as well. Uh, the other thing is, uh, is all about, you know, what are the challenges in the rural part? We know some of the things that might be challenging will be related to the equipment availability because, I mean, I think a lot of the time, I mean, if we want to do a um, cough assist, for example, uh, for SME patient, unfortunately, we, um, we, A, we've, <laughs> um, we've, not, we've not got many respiratory pediatrician, B, well, maybe we're not trained to do so as well. So there will be some uh, refine and tuning to um, assist us in order to um, help uh, to make it more available. And, 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 and other than that will relate to the support and navigation of care. I think this is important okay. because I mean, I, I, I presume in the rural part, I mean, the service is there, definitely. Right? There, there are service. I mean, I'm, I'm working in palliative care and uh, we, I mean, like, obviously, I mean, before this, I mean, I asked uh, similar to Dr. Ku, Echo as well. Uh, before this SMA type 1, we treat it conservatively. But now, with the availability of the drugs, I mean, it's a game changer. So we kind of like assist and then try to um, help in terms of symptom management most of the time. So I think, um, you know, availability, availability of the drugs, access to this drug, access to the equipment, access to the support. So there are many, many things that need to be done so that we, we are much more, uh, you know, getting more equal in terms of service, Not you know, don't just disregard, you know, don't just put all the, um, for all the <laughs> money to the West Coast only. So East Coast as well, because there are a number of uh, children here who suffer similar conditions as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faisha. I think that needs to be uh, unashamedly declared. There needs to be more money for the East Coast uh, as well for healthcare. And, and certainly there's a lot of over on, on, on the West Coast there of Smananjung, especially. Uh, I want to just go to Dr. Tan. You know, it's been spoken quite a bit about the role of doctors, and definitely it does make a difference in terms of how patients are able to navigate the, uh, the, the pathway. So you work quite a bit in developing guidelines for doctors. Uh, and uh, what can you say about uh, wanting to make medical professionals do better or improve themselves in helping with that patient decision-making and providing treatment and care of individuals with rare diseases such as SMA? Um, and also, I'm just going to combine this question that just came in. Um, and is asking, you know, how much do medical students really uh, learn about SMA or uh, neuromuscular disorders? Uh, can this be further improved on, especially in the curriculum, uh, to ensure that there's better awareness so that doctors can know better of their patients that they're treating? Go ahead, Dr. Tan. Uh, okay, um, thanks, uh, Mr. Asru. Um, the part about like being a healthcare professional, I think, um, you know, let, let's talk about parents, you know, since we are on the pediatric topic today and and I think it goes back to um, the broader definition of best interest of a child you know and and it's not just um, the medical needs but you know the child as part of his um, family and part of the society and his other interests um, at, like in education you know um, forming connections with his siblings you know uh, being loved by his siblings, his family, and you know, 
whether he could make his own opinion, you know, and and to see life uh, the way that he wants, you know, um, how he defines it. So I think I think it is it is something that you know that that opens up my mind, you know, being in bioethics and you know having um, some direct training from John Lantos himself in the U.S. and and it is this is what they they were looking at that you know the definition of you know how to look at the best interests of the patient and and you know i think as a healthcare professional we, we need to actually keep it there you know to actually understand how parents are struggling and how they make decisions and not to be judgmental and you know then then when when they don't come for follow ups you know when they they can't meet up with um, all the requirements of care itself you know why is that so you know and and to be to be appreciative of you know all these struggles and we, we don't put that pressure on them in the sense that we try our best and understand what they're going through but also be a strong way at a more systemic level like what you know Dr. Ku, Dr. Chung is trying and Dr. Fahir Sham is here to actually kind of putting our extra time at the side to trying to see whether there's any, whether, you know, you, we could actually work um, uh, beyond the walls of our wards and clinics, you know, to actually help um, this population. I think, I think importantly, I think we are not just only trying to make sure that they are well, they are healthy, but they are able to flourish as well, you know, and, and you know, and, and that part is something that I think in Malaysia, we, we are not there yet. <laughs> and I think we are still struggling with even to maintain um, the adequate standard of care for children. And, and I think the focus and attention and, you know, the budgets and, you know, is, is definitely never adequate for our children in this country. And I think, I think that is the part where doctors uh, would, would be, would, you know, would want to actually go into social advocacy and, you know, trying to make things better for our patients, you know. So there's two levels, you know, being understanding when you are seeing the families in front of you and also on the other end of like how much you could actually do um, because you are directly involved, you know, with their care and you could see firsthand, you know, what's going on. And I think that that is how we should be training our, um, um, you know, um, our medical students, you know, is... We, that, that's the word for it. You know, there's a word for medical humility. What what we can can we know or we don't we, we don't know and we can't offer. Okay. And you know and and to understand that you know that parents you know the way that they are making decisions. You know how are they making? You know is there any power differences between both um, um, parties? Um, and also to understand the social determinants to health, which is also related to pediatric care and child health. You know um, you know yeah. how. I think you will understand what, what is that. Of, you of know, course, kind of, yeah. Uh, no, I, it's, yeah, so. it's an important point to make, really, among others, is that we need our policymakers to look beyond the walls of their institutions, of hospitals, clinics, and so forth, and be able to look back and consult the communities that are needing that kind of assistance and need the kind of changes that need to be made. And also the doctors, the community of doctors themselves need to be heard and also consulted and also changed when it comes to these issues. And it requires for our policymakers to, to, to engage on that. Uh, you know, we're coming to the end of, of the session today, but uh, I don't want us to leave without uh, having Dr. Ku, uh, you know, uh, sharing with us a little bit of his hopes uh, concerning what he wants to see in advancement for healthcare on SMA and what kind of changes do you, do you want uh, to see happen? And perhaps if you could just say maybe three things <laughs> that you'd like to see uh, changed. Uh, Go ahead, Dr. Hu. Okay. Uh, thank you, Asrul. Uh, I'd like to say uh, more than three things. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, um, uh, I, w I would like to see uh, optimized strategies uh, that can uh, uh, maximize uh, functional level and enhance quality of uh, life of children and families um, with SMA through multidisciplinary approach. And, um, and I would like to see that this happen not only in my own hospital, but it should also um, empower those hospitals, especially those with a, a pediatric neurologist or geneticist uh, to take up this challenge and become a so-called treatment center for children with SMA. Uh, we have actually, um, we plan actually to start a national um, registry for children SMA. 
so that we can have a clearer picture of the demographics, prevalence, the type, the functional level. And this is very important uh, when, um, 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 when um, uh, clinical trials come along our way. Uh, and also when we start treating a patient with SMA with uh, um, disease modifying drugs. And in fact, uh, um, we have actually submitted a fairly detailed uh, proposal to Ministry of Health on treatment of children SMA with disease morning fine drug in uh, two months ago in Ju uh, June this year, uh, based on available clinical evidence on uh, in terms of the efficacy, the safety, and of course the budget impact uh, that will have on the government. And lastly, um, uh, we have also asked the uh, Ministry of Health to consider a newborn screening uh, program for SMA uh, in our proposal, uh, because we know that uh, the earlier we treat them, the better outcome uh, the, the patient will be. So I think that's basically the gist of uh, things that uh, uh, we try to do and hope that it will come to fruition uh, in years to come. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Hu. It looks like you know we need to actually organize uh, another forum because we need a few more hours perhaps, even with Dr. Hu. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that. You know, we started off uh, this discussion with a voice from someone uh, living with SMA, and I thought it'd be good that we close with uh, the voice of someone who is caring for uh, those with SMA. And, and perhaps, you know, Katsha, uh, I would like to ask, uh, you know, how is it in terms of your your your, your own feelings concerning uh, how you've seen it change so much uh, from when you uh, were uh, facing this issue with your daughters and now over time you now see it's possible that people like yourself reach out and help others, especially the friend that you've helped. How do you feel uh, in moving forward that we are seeing this grow so positively and so many people are now being able to be helped even through this webinar uh, and launch here today. Go ahead. Um, uh, now, now it's become very emotional. <laughs> it's just the ending part, you know. Okay, Kasha, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I think um, uh, to, to all the parents, you know, caregivers, uh, patients, uh, we know that the journey is very tough, okay? Um, banyak halangan, you know, cabaran, apa yang kita tempu, and bakal kita tempu. But please um, remain hopeful and be strong, okay? And uh, it's okay to cry. I cry a lot, okay? You know, you ask, you can ask Aina, okay? And um, just do the best. Uh, give the best, you know, do your best. And we pray that, you know, all the SME patients, kids, or adults patients, all types of SME, type 1, 2, 3, will receive their treatment soon, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Katsha. I, I, I cannot end it any better really uh, with that about wanting to see uh, the ability to affect change which will help uh, others and in such a way that we are able to see what is in a small number of people today will be the norm in the future that more people with SMA are able to get the treatment and therapies that they need and the support and help for their caregivers, families and um, the people who love them. Uh, you know, We've learned so much this morning, uh, and I must say that we need to be able to look to each other, the strength to be able to build on what we've learned, what we've, uh, the networks that we've helped create in order for us to look at the low-hanging fruit that's available today and see where we can already affect the most change in the strength that we have today. I mean, we can take action now. We know who the stakeholders are. We know who our strengths are who our champions are when it comes to uh, rare disease, and especially when it comes to uh, SMA, uh, we can do better. If it took previously uh, several years in order to get to one uh, point, we can perhaps do it better today. We need, uh, I think, faster engagement with the stakeholders and perhaps even say, and I take this inspiration from uh, Sharu's uh, at the very beginning of her speech is that, you know, we need to look at obstacles 
to not be excuses for us to not move forward and perhaps look at it as a way for us to, to take that and to see how we can affect those changes that we want to see. How do we make it real reality? Who do we bring in to uh, help us in our journey? So I just wanted to have a, a reminder again for all of us to take a look at smcare.org. Uh, there is on that uh, website, the S my SMA diary, which is in both English and Bahasa, which is intended to guide families and healthcare providers. And you can download it from that uh, website. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our colleagues here today, um, Dr. Hu Tekbeng, Dr. Tan Hui Siu, uh, Sharuz Katsha, Dr. Fahisham, Dr. Cheng early on, and Edmund, uh, who have been so inspiring for this event today. And, and we are definitely looking at moving this conversation forward. Uh, you know, I take inspiration from uh, Dr. Tan, who just put here, you know, you are the light and force. We can make things happen. We can change things. And definitely, we need to move this conversation towards just not just talk about it, but make things happen, actions and change to help save lives and change uh, lives with SMA. So with that, uh, I'm Azra Mokkalit from the Galen Centre for Health and Social Policy. Thank you all to the SMA community uh, for coming out this morning to join us in this report launch of the Living with Spinal Muscular Atrophy in Malaysia document. With that, uh, I wish you all uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day and weekend ahead. Thank you.